Hello and welcome to the Illinois Learn to Hunt presents plant identification for Illinois hunters. Uh, so this course is going to be a broad uh, intro to identifying some plant species that you may find beneficial to know about if you're going to be hunting in Illinois. Uh, the course outline is going to entail identification techniques of leaf types, leaf arrangement, leaf mar mar margins, and uh, we split up the trees to be nut bearing and fruit bearing and shrub and woody uh, versus uh, each other. And then also we're gonna have time at the very end for question and answer. Uh, just some overall uh, house cleaning exercises here. We're gonna talk about no video, okay? So you don't need your video. Uh, you do not need your microphones either. So sit back and relax as we go over the information. Uh, you can use your chat function um, that we use to tell you guys that the meeting was gonna be starting soon. You can just put in any question you have there during the presentation and we can answer that in the chat. Uh, the person who's gonna be talking may answer it while they're talking. If not, we have other people on that may answer it in the chat. Um, if we don't get to your question, we'll have time at the end for question and answering. Uh, so then um, tomorrow you can expect a survey um, asking guys how you enjoyed this presentation. If there's any other information you may wanna know about um, plant identification. So please fill that out and get that back to us and we will make those improvements as you guys point them out to us. So today, our, present, our main presenter is gonna be Dan Stevens and Adam. Uh, Dan, if you'd like to say hi real quick. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming tonight. Awesome, and then we also have Adam with us. Adam, you wanna say hi? How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining us tonight. Awesome. And yes, we will. This, this is going to be a very slide focused uh, presentation. So we will be providing these slides to you guys tomorrow in that email with the survey. We will give you guys actually uh, the PowerPoint presentation and we will give you a YouTube link to this presentation as well for future reference if you need that. So uh, you can look forward to seeing that tomorrow. And then I'm Jason Buckley also uh, just saying hi real fast here. So we can get started here. I believe Dan is going to be starting us off. Perfect, thanks Jason. Um, yeah, so before we get too heavy into kind of species overview, there's a few different terminologies and, and different definitions that it, it will be advantageous to, to quickly go over. Um, one of the most important aspects of really any kind of plant identification is being able to identify a few different structures on the plant. Um, and the first one obviously is gonna be the leaf. Um, obviously leaves are one of the most important parts of the plant. Um, they are crucial to gathering energy, respiration, and uh, protection, but they can also provide a valuable food source for many wildlife species. Um, so there's a few different types of leaves um, that we're going to go over today. Um, the first is going to be a simple leaf. Um, so this is the leaf that most people are um, familiar with. If you're familiar with a maple tree, an oak tree, um, those are all simple leaves. Then we have this other classification of uh, what, what we call compound leaves. Um, so compound leaves are essentially where the leaf blade is divided um, and that forms leaflets. So if you look at these illustrations on the right, you can see we have a pinnately compound um, leaf, which is indicative of a black walnut. And when most people see a, a leaf that looks like this, you might, you know, at, at first glance, think every little one of these uh, kind of structures is its own individual leaf. Uh, but in truth, the entire thing is considered a leaf. Um, so basically you can identify a leaf by tracing back that stem or tracing back um, where it attaches to the stem. And this will become more clear as we kind of move through a few different examples. Um, but essentially we have the simple leaf um, and then we have compound leaves. And the compound leaves can be broken into a few different types. Um, so we have palmate, which is similar to a, a clover. Um, a few different trees that, that also have palmately compound leaves are um, buckeyes. So if you're familiar with what a buckeye tree looks like, that's a, a pretty good example of a palmately compound. Um, and then the pinnately compound, and uh, we'll go over quite a few species that, that do contain uh, pinnately compound leaves. Um, a few examples are the pecan tree, the black walnut, um, honey locust, ash trees. Um, so there's a lot of different trees that, that have these various structures. Um, so you'll hear me use these terms kind of as we move through the presentation. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Another very important component of uh, plant identification, in addition to leaf type, is how the leaves are arranged on the tree. 
So essentially you have, you want to look at where the leaf attaches to the stem and that's going to be termed the node. Um, so if you look at the opposite trees, you can see you have two leaves from the same node. So you have leaves on opposite sides of the twig. Um, where alternate, you essentially have one leaf per node, um, and then you have world, um, and then basil, uh, which is something we're really not going to cover today. Uh, but if you do join into our part two, where we kind of cover um, graminoids and herbaceous vegetation, um, that's a term that we we'll use um, a lot more then. Another important component that we're going to pay quite a bit of attention to is the leaf margin. Um, so what does the outside of that leaf look like? Um, and there's a few different classifications here. Um, basically, an entire leaf is one that has an entire leaf margin. So it doesn't have any serrations. It doesn't have any, any unique lobes. Um, it's just a straightforward leaf. Um, and then we have what, what many people call uh, toothed, or sometimes it's often referred to as serrated. Um, so you have single tooth or single serrated leaf margins, um, which essentially looks like a saw blade. And then you have doubly tooth, which is essentially a single tooth, but the, each individual tooth has another tooth. So it's kind of doubly toothed or doubly serrated. Um, and then the last one that, that we're going to touch on is lobed. Um, and so that's really common in oak species. Um, and so we'll, we'll see those uh, kind of carry on as we move through this presentation. A few other terms that, that I just want to try to identify just so you're aware as we kind of move through this presentation. Um, a big component of specifically woody plant identification, um, so that's trees, shrubs, um, some of these woody vines, um, is the amount of light that that specific species can tolerate. Um, so we essentially have kind of two different classifications. We have shade tolerant and then we have shade intolerant. Um, so those shade tolerant species are readily able to um, essentially grow in dark areas. So they don't need an enormous amount of sunlight to grow. Um, those shade intolerant species really struggle when they get inside of a forest. And so they really need to be uh, more prominently in open areas. A few other terms is deciduous. Um, so this basically is a plant that, shed its, that sheds its leaves seasonally. Um, so some examples of that are oak, maple, hickory, and then in comparison, we have the evergreen. Um, so these are gonna be your trees that, that have leaves throughout the year and are kind of always green. So you have pine, um, fir, spruce, and cedar. So now that we kind of have some of that, that background um, out of the way, we're really gonna start diving into kind of an overview of individual species. And most people are probably familiar with oaks um, but it's arguably one of the most important family of trees and family of plants that we have in the state. So this is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time is looking at individual oaks, looking at what species utilize um, these individual trees, and of course, how we can kind of identify these trees. So just some, some characteristics of oaks. Um, they are very hardy trees and they, they live um, quite a bit of time. Um, they also produce acorns that are, again, readily consumed by many different wildlife species. Um, they do have alternate leaf arrangement. So if you think back to that, that term we, we discussed a few minutes ago, that essentially means one leaf per node. Um, so th those leaves are going to come off individually as opposed to having them on opposite sides um, of the twig. Uh, another really unique characteristic of, of oaks is that they're, they're a very hardy tree in that they have the ability to retain their leaves um, kind of through fall and through winter. Um, if you go just kind of look out in the woods during fall or winter and you kind of look up, the majority of leaves that you're still seeing on trees um, are going to be oaks. Now those leaves will be dead and brown, uh, but they still kind of retain um, those leaves um, through winter, which gives kind of a unique advantage for, for plant identification, especially in fall and winter. Um, a lot of times it can be difficult to identify species if you don't have leaves on the trees. Uh, but the nice thing is those oak species do have that capacity uh, to retain those leaves throughout fall. Um, the flowering and fruiting occurs in, in kind of late spring once all the frost danger has passed. I'm sure everybody's familiar with kind of oak flowers. If you look at this picture here, um, they are referred to as oak catkins, um, C-A-T-K-I-N-S. 
Um, so that essentially is the, the flower of the oak tree. Now there's kind of two different groups of oak trees. Um, so there's, you have a red oak group and you also have a white oak group. And there's many different species kind of associated with each group, uh, but there's a few different things to, to keep in mind, uh, particularly in regards to acorn production um, between these two different groups. So red oaks have a two year acorn maturation. So essentially they're still going to drop acorns every single year, but it takes an individual acorn two years to fully develop on, um, on that tree. In comparison, the white oaks um, produce an acorn every year and it takes one year to mature. Now the red oak acorns are higher in tannic content than, than white oaks, and that makes them taste a little bit more bitter and that is why, uh, kind of given a choice, most species of wildlife, um, deer in particular, will focus on white oak acorns early in fall, and then they may transition to red oaks later in the year. Um, and not, not just because of palatability of, of kind of the acorn itself, but the really interesting thing is that red oaks, the acorns remain viable a lot longer on the ground um, than, than white oaks do. White oaks are generally consumed first, but they also have this tendency to basically rot um, rather quickly. Um, so any of those acorns that aren't really gathered up quick and, and consumed quickly are just gonna rot on the ground where you're still gonna have a pretty big um, population and, and kind of food, food source um, of these red oaks. And the biggest way to be able to differentiate between a, a tree that is, a red, that is in kind of that red oak group and the tree that is in the white oak group is, is looking at the leaves. Um, so if we look at these two individual leaves here, we can see one on the left, the lobes all come to a point, um, where on the right, you can see you kind of have these nice rounded lobes, um, and that is indicative of a white oak. So in this individual picture, we have a, a, a red oak on the left and a white oak on the right. And if you look at the tips of the red oak lobes, um, you'll notice what many people call bristle tips. And so it looks like a very short um, kind of pubescent hair that is on the, the, the tip of those, um, of those lobes. And that is kind of the defining characteristic between a red oak and a white oak. So if you ever see a red oak leaf and it's got those bristle tips, that's gonna let you know it's a red oak. And now we're really gonna start diving into to some species overview. And we're gonna start off with one that that most people are, are fairly familiar with, and that is going to be um, the white oak. Um, so white oaks are typically found in moist or dry woods and on wooded slopes. And so if you pay attention to that sentence, it, it almost sounds like they can grow pretty much anywhere, um, and that's true, they, they really can. Um, the, the white oak is very characterized by its unique um, bark. Um, so if, if you're familiar with kind of a shag bark hickory or a shell bark hickory, um, you may, know what I'm kind of discussing, but it's got this very unique platy bark. Um, so it almost looks like the bark is peeling away from the tree. And that provides a really, really good habitat for a lot of different species, uh, particularly bats. Um, they'll kind of use those folded over flaps of bark to, to nest under and things like that. So in addition to kind of game species, they're a very important ecological tree um, in Illinois. So again, this is an oak, so it is gonna have a alternate um, leaf arrangement. And typically the, the leaves are gonna be kind of seven to nine of these very rounded lobes. And again, they're not gonna have bristle tips on the end of those lobes. Um, the top of the leaf is fairly smooth as well as the underside. Um, a few other species that we'll get to later on will have kind of a, a unique pubescence, um, which basically means very short, and kind of stubby hairs on the underside of the leaf. Um, and so this is a good characteristic of the white oak is that it does not contain that. Leaves on the tree may vary in appearance. And I, I put that bullet in kind of in the beginning because it's very important to understand that not all leaves look the same. Um, there's kind of two different groups of leaves. Um, so you'll hear people use the term shade leaves as well as sun leaves. Um, so those shade leaves are gonna be much bigger and typically the lobes are not gonna be as deep. Um, and that's just because, you know, the way photosynthesis works, um, if it's in a darker area, it needs more surface area. So it's gonna make those leaves bigger. 
And now if you go to the outside of the tree where you have leaves that are in constant direct sunlight, um, those leaves are gonna typically be smaller and their lobes are gonna be much deeper. Um, and so a lot of times those lobes will almost go kind of all the way past the half point of the leaf. So it's gonna have really, really deep lobes. Now there's some really interesting um, wildlife food value with um, white oaks. In addition to the acorns um, being, you know, a, a readily available food source for many species, white oaks are really heavily browsed um, in, in the spring, uh, particularly in areas where, um, kind of in upland areas where there's a lot of acorn regeneration. So you have a lot of these younger oaks that start growing up in the forest. Um, and if you see those kind of in the spring, um, those are gonna be browsed very readily um, by deer. Um, but obviously the most important food aspect of the white oak is the acorns. Um, it's notable um, food source for turkeys, for wood ducks, um, for pheasants, for many other species of birds, um, rabbits, squirrels, and deer. So pretty much anything will eat kind of a white oak acorn. And again, that's just because it lacks a lot of that bitterness that the, the red oaks um, typically contain. Up next, we have the pin oak. Um, and this is a, a tree that a lot of people are probably familiar with because it's been planted ornamentally um, a lot in the past few decades. So it's something you'll see in a lot of church grounds, in a lot of uh, college campuses, a lot of high school campuses. Um, so it's something you'll kind of see readily. Um, this is a native species to Illinois. It is typically found along um, floodplains. It's a, it's a very um, riparian um, species, which means that it likes very hydric soils and very wet soils. Um, again, it's another oak, so the leaves are going to be arranged um, op alternately along the stem. Now, if you look at this picture of a leaf, just think about it for a few seconds. Would you call that a red oak or a white oak? And if you thought red oak, um, you are correct. So you can see it has those very pronounced, very pointed lobes. Um, and if it was a kind of more high quality picture, you would be able to see bristle tips on the tips of those lobes. And a really good kind of identifying characteristic of this species is that the, the sinuses or, the, so the sinuses are essentially the spaces between the lobes. Um, so they're these two open, they're the open areas between the lobes. Um, and in pin oaks, those sinuses are typically U-shaped. Um, and they're extremely deep cut. So you can see how deep those lobes are um, compared to some other species. And that's retained even in those shade leaves um, that we mentioned a, a little bit ago. Um, they will still have these very pronounced sinuses between the lobes as well. And now a really important characteristic of this specific species is that it's known to retain um, dead dying limbs throughout its life. And so it's very common um, when you see a lot of these pin oaks is just to look up and you're gonna see these distinctive dead branches um, kind of on the, the lower trunks. Now the really nice thing about the pin oak is it's a fairly smaller acorn and so it can be eaten by, a, a, again, a wide variety of species. Um, it's eaten by many songbirds, uh, many wild turkeys, deer, squirrels, but it is very, very, very high food source for waterfowl. Um, again, it is a riparian and hydric um, tree and so it's gonna really like these moist soils. And what that means is the pin oak is very um, kind of tolerant to, to flooding. Um, so if it's in an area that, that's naturally flooded, that's not gonna damage the tree. And that's kind of why it's a favorite for many waterfowl species is that it's a smaller acorn that they can get their mouth around. And it's also very prominent in kind of the habitat that, that many of our waterfowl species utilize. Up next is the shingle oak. Um, and if you look at this species and you're not extremely familiar with um, kind of with trees, it might be something that you wouldn't even necessarily classify as an oak. Because um, most people, when you, when you think of an oak, you think of that typical oak leaf that we've been kind of showing in the past few ones, where this one, it's got that entire leaf margin, so it has no lobes. And it essentially just looks like your standard leaf. Um, but again, if you look at that leaf arrangement, you can see that it is alternate along the stem. And so that gives you a pretty good indication that it is in fact an oak, as well as the acorns um, on the tree. That's a, a pretty good indicator as well. Um, but this tree is fairly nondescript um, other than it's kind of uniquely shaped leaves for oaks. 
Um, it's got a very glossy cover, which you can kind of see on the, the on these pictures on the upper surface of the leaf. It's it's very glossy, and if you look on the underside, it does have um, some of that kind of pubescence that we discussed earlier. And so, if you take your finger on kind of the underside of the leaf and use your fingernail, you'll actually scrape off some of those hairs. Um, so you you will see that. Um, it is a very important food for um, squirrels and some birds. It's not readily consumed by deer um, like some of the other species, uh, but it is something they still will forage on if it's available, but it's certainly not a pre food, preferred food source um, for deer, but it is a very good food source for turkeys. Up next is the swamp white oak. Um, and again, this is a, a, another unique oak species in that it, it kind of doesn't really look like an oak. Um, if you're familiar with uh, chinkapin or um, some of these other species, that it has a leaf shape that, that's somewhat similar up to that. But the dead giveaway about the, the swamp white oak is the underside of that leaf. Um, you can see how, how white it is. And that white is some of that pubescence that we've been discussing. So this specific species of tree has a lot of pubescence on the underside of that leaf, um, making it kind of have this, this overall white appearance. Um, now this species, just like its name, it's gonna be found in very riparian areas. Um, however, it does not like permanent flooding, um, but it can tolerate kind of seasonal flooding. Um, so if you have some flooding in fall and winter, um, it can tolerate that as long as that flooding is during the dormant season. If it starts to get water on it during the growing season, it, it tends to, to suffer a little bit. And th this tree is also um, kind of unique in that it attracts a variety of bird species. Um, it's typically not consumed um, by many game species um, unless they kind of come across it. But again, kind of like the last one, it's not a preferred food source. Um, so typically, you're not really going to be hunting in air in areas where the species is commonly found unless you're kind of hunting waterfowl or, or things like that, uh, but it is a good tree um, to know. Now bur oaks, if you look at the size of that acorn as well as kind of the shape of that acorn, um, it is by far the largest um, acorn of any North American oak species, and it's a very, very, very important wildlife food. Um, I think a lot of people don't spend too much time um, focusing on bur oaks. And a lot of that is due just because they're not as common on the landscape as some of our other oak species. Uh, but it is very, very, very important um, as a wildlife food source. Now, it can be found statewide. Um, and if you look at the, the leaf, it's got this very unique shaped leaf. Um, it, it's pretty recognizable and very hard to um, kind of mix up with other species. You can see it's got kind of this triangular lobe at the top. And then as you go further down the leaf, um, the, those lobes get much deeper um, and they kind of go almost all the way to, to the mid rib of that leaf. But what I, what I really want to point out about this specific species is it has something, it, it has this unique adaptation, um, which many people call masting. Um, and so that essentially is, it's going to have very heavy nut crops but it's not gonna do it every year. Typically, it's gonna have a very heavy nut crop um, every few years. And that's kind of a unique evolutionary adaptation because what it, what it allows is you have this really large seed drop that kind of overwhelms um, the ability for a lot of these species to consume it. Um, so there's gonna be lots of acorns and seeds left on the ground, um, which will allow that species to propagate in a certain area. And that kind of ensures um, again, the survival of the acorn so that it can continue um, to regenerate in that specific stand. Um, bur oak acorns are the preferred food source for many species, um, including deer, turkey, um, wood ducks um, really like bur oaks, as well as rabbits, squirrels, and of course, many kind of rodent species. Uh, but what's really unique about this acorn is if you look at the, the acorn cap, um, so most people call it kind of the cap. Um, if you look, if you talk to botanists and things, they call it a cupule, uh, but we're essentially referring to the acorn cap. And in this specific species, that acorn cap covers almost the entire acorn. So you can see that entire acorn is kind of wrapped up um, in that, that cap. And it has these really unique 
um, kind of fringed scales on the edge of that acorn. And so that's a really good identifying characteristic for this species is if you see that acorn, um, you basically know exactly what it is. Um, the next species we're going to discuss is the northern red oak. Um, so this is a species that typically grows in very rich and upland soils. Um, you occasionally will find it along river, river banks, uh, but if it is along river banks, it's typically going to be on very well-drained slopes. Um, so areas that, that don't hold a lot of water, um, it can have frequent water as long as that water doesn't kind of stay there. Um, and if you look at these, these two pictures, these two leaves at the top right, um, this is a really good illustration of that, that concept of, of your shade leaves um, versus your sun leaves. So on the left, we have a nice example of a shade leaf um, from the northern red oak, or on the right, we have kind of that, that sun leaf. And you can see kind of the, the physical distinctions uh, between the two species. Um, now the northern red oak is fairly easy to identify. There's a few other species that you might get it confused with, um, but the, the biggest one you might get it confused with is the, the black oak, which we'll discuss um, later on down the road. But the really cool thing is that acorns from the northern red oak, it is kind of the preferred red oak species um, for acorns. And so it's going to be eaten by, again, wild turkeys, deer, squirrels, raccoons, um, as well as many birds. And deer will, will often feed on the, the twigs and on the branches during, during fall and winter as other food sources are, are somewhat scarce. Uh, but I, I want you to focus on the, the acorn on this specific um, species. If you think back to that, that acorn cap that we just looked at, you can see how different um, those individual acorns are. And so acorns can be a really easy way to identify a lot of these species. Um, particularly if you're just kind of trying to decide if it's something that, that is readily eaten by, by wildlife or if it's kind of one of these that, that's not necessarily as preferred. Um, this specific example, it has a very, very, very shallow um, acorn cap or cupule um, that almost looks like it's barely connected to the acorn. Um, and that, that's very indicative of the, of the northern red oak. Up next is the American beech. And I would bet a lot of people probably think this is kind of somewhat out of place, um, but I want to point out that the oak family is actually referred to as the beech family. Um, and this is a, a very characteristic species kind of of the Midwest. Um, everybody's probably seen movies where they, they, you know, there's kind of this romantic scene and they go out for a nice hike and they start carving their name into a tree. 95% um, of the time, that's going to be in an American beech. Um, and that's simply due to the fact that it has this very smooth bark. Um, it doesn't have a lot of that kind of corky projections that many of the other species do. So it's got this very smooth bark. And it's something that you can really identify the species. Um, I kind of call it a, what I call a 60 mile per hour tree uh, because it's so easy to identify. You can do it, you know, moving down the interstate at 60 miles an hour. Not that I recommend that, but. Um, so yeah, the American beech is uh, characterized by that uniquely smooth bark. Um, it's typically found on kind of the, the eastern half of the state. Um, occasionally, there's a few that can be found, you know, near Pike County and some of these other western parts, uh, but it's a lot more um, common in the eastern half of the state. Now, the American beech has a very unique fruit. Um, it's called, obviously, a beech nut, and it's going to be eaten again by um, many different species. It's going to be eaten by birds, by mammals. Um, and it's a, it, it contains a lot of nutrition um, for wildlife. Um, so we'll kind of quickly go over the leaves here, but the, the dead giveaway for the American beech is that really smooth bark. Um, but the leaves, what I, what I like to focus on with the leaves is if you look at the leaf venation. So you have this one very strong kind of mid rib that runs um, straight down the center of the leaf, and then you have all these alternate venate kind of veins coming off it. And now with the American beech, you can see how those are almost parallel. Um, so they're in very straight lines. They don't have any curves or bends to them. And if you see that, that kind of parallel leaf venation, um, that is a very good indicator that it's an American beech. Um, there's about three or four other species that kind of have similar venation, uh, but the leaves look totally different. Um, and now it might look like in this picture that these leaves are, um, that the leaf margin is entire. Uh, but if you focus a little bit closer, you can actually see that they are serrated. 
and it's all, it's really interesting. The serrations on the American beach are almost just continuations of the leaf vein. Um, so essentially everywhere you'll see a serration on the margin is where you'll see kind of that, that leaf vein um, coming to the, to the edge of that leaf. Now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and kind of move away from oaks and now we'll kind of move into the, the black walnut or the hickory family. Everybody's probably somewhat familiar with the, the pecan. If not, um, I'll invite you over for Thanksgiving. We'll have some, some good pecan pie. Uh, but pecans are typically found along moist soils. Um, they're another riparian species. And I want you to look at this leaf here in the bottom right and just kind of think to yourself, what type of leaf do you think that is? Um, remember, we had a few different types. We had um, simple, we had palmately compound, and we had pinnately compound. And this specific species is pinnately compound. And so if you look at this picture in the bottom right, that entire structure is the leaf and those individual portions of that leaf are called leaflets. Um, so just keep that in mind and that, that's the really big indicator for pecans is the leaf. Um, another really big characteristic obviously is the fruit, but if you look really closely again at the leaf venation, you can see that they almost all curve down. And so that's a really good indicator um, that it is a pecan. Now, early settlers in, of North America really loved um, pecans. Um, they were not only great to, to eat, but they used to ship and, and kind of send them to different markets uh, for cash. Uh, but what's really interesting is they used to chop these entire trees down um, so that they could essentially get the nuts. Instead of you know, shaking the tree or trying some different methods, they would just cut the entire, entire tree down um, and then pick the nuts up that way. And so this kind of short-sighted approach really led to um, kind of pecans be, becoming somewhat scarce on the landscape um, in early settlement. Um, nowadays, you, you'll see them readily um, in Illinois woodlands, um, and they provide a, gr a great food source for many different species, as well as humans, um, squirrels, deer. Um, I think foxes have been recorded eating pecans, as well as wild turkeys. Um, and they are a really, again, Think about where the pecan tree lives. So it's gonna be found in moist woodlands, typically in riparian areas along rivers. And so it is a very, very, very prominent food source for wood ducks. Um, there's a few other duck species that'll readily eat it, uh, but wood ducks will kind of really focus on finding a nice pecan stand and, and really eating and ingesting a lot of these different species. Now, if you look at the specific nut, um, you can see that there's, kind of four flaps that that, that that nut is gonna kind of open up into and you'll find that seed inside. And if you look at these flaps, you can see they almost have raised ridges um, alongside the top. And just kind of keep that in mind because there's a few other species that we'll get to that the nut could look somewhat similar to this one, but it does not have those kind of prominent raised ridges um, along, along the, the nut. Up next is the mocker nut hickory. Um, and this is by far probably the, not probably, it is by far the most abundant species of hickory um, that we have in Illinois. Um, it is a very long lived tree. Um, I believe there's been a few documentations of this tree in kind of the Missouri Ozarks that have lived well over 500 years. And while typically it, it's not really necessary to understand the scientific name um, of a specific tree, but in this case, I, I think it'll, it'll help um, kind of identify the species. Um, so the scientific name is Caria tomentosa. And tomentosa comes from the Latin word um, tomentum, which essentially means covered with dense short hairs. Um, and unfortunately, these pictures don't really show it. But if you were um, kind of looking at this leaf, every single part of this, this leaf, the, 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 the nuts are all covered in these very short hairs. Um, if you look at this picture in the bottom right, you can even see along that, that leaf petiole, or you know, kind of, you can start to see those pubescent hairs. And so that's a really good indicator of a macronut hickory, is just that the entire leaf, the leaflets, are all covered in these very short hairs. Now, this specific species has a very thick um, hull on its nut. So if you look at the, the size of the nut, you can see it's a fairly robust um, nut. 
But if you were to crack it open, you would see that in comparison to some of the other hickory species, that hull is going to be, you know, in some cases half an inch thick. And so that's a really good indicator just looking at, at kind of the shells on the ground. Um, so let's say you're, you're wanting to go squirrel hunting. Maybe you'll walk through an area and you start to find all these different um, shells on the ground. Well, you can start to utilize some of those to identify the species that are there as well. Um, the mockernut hickory, again, one of the thickest hulls, and it's typically dispersed between September and December, which makes it a very, very, very preferred uh, mast crop for um, squirrels, um, which will kind of eat the, the green nut on the inside. They'll crack it open and eat that portion on the inside. Um, rabbits and deer will also feed on the nuts, uh, but typically the, the rabbits and deer are actually going to eat um, some of the bark of the tree, um, and they're really going to focus on the, the foliage, so the leaves, as well as some of the, the twigs. And it's also kind of a, we'll say it's a minor food source, um, specifically for ducks, but also for quail and turkey. Um, most people, when you think about, you know, quail or pheasants, they probably don't really think about, you know, tree, nut-bearing trees as being a food source um, for some of these ground nesting birds. Uh, but the mockernut hickory has been documented lots um, inside of, of northern bobwhite quail. Um, so it's a, a fairly preferred um, food source for quail. Up next, we have the shag bark hickory. Um, so this is a species that's going to be found in very upland areas. Um, and if you look at, this is another one of those uh, kind of 60 mile per hour trees. Um, if you look at the, the bark on this picture, you can see it, it's got that very plate-like bark where it almost looks like the bark is, is kind of peeling away um, from, from the trunk of the tree. And if you look at the way that those kind of plates come off, um, it's a very good hiding spot for a lot of different species. And like Chad mentioned, um, not recommended for a climber stand. This is not a very good tree to try to climb with a tree stand um, due to kind of that unique plate, platey bark. Um, it will peel off as you start climbing it and you'll start sliding down the tree. Um, so don't use a shag bark hickory to climb. Uh, but the shag bark hickory is, um, it's a, a fairly um, common species in Illinois, uh, particularly in upland areas. Of, and again, it's really characterized by that platy bark. Um, as you start to look at more of these trees, you'll kind of learn a single characteristic for a, a specific species, and that's kind of what you focus on. And for the shag bark hickory, um, it's the bark for me. Um, it's one of those you can just quickly see the bark and go, okay, shag bark hickory. Now, if you think back to the white oak, um, we also mentioned that the white oak kind of has this, this platy bark as well. Uh, but the interesting thing about the white oak is the, the platiness seems to go away as the, the tree gets bigger. And so to, to find kind of that, that platiness of the bark on a white oak, you're going to have to look a little bit further up in the tree um, where the shag bark hickory, it's kind of have, going to have that platiness pretty much all the way down to the ground. Um, it is a very readily consumed um, nut by rabbits, mallards, um, wood ducks, and again, quail and turkey. Um, and deer will occasionally eat the nut. Um, but they're going to primarily focus on, on kind of new growth. Um, so any growth um, that, that's kind of coming up and regenerating from some of the seeds, um, they will come and kind of browse those new plants. Um, and occasionally they'll eat on the leaves or the, the twigs of the bigger trees. Uh, but typically they're not going to be able to reach the twigs on a shag bark hickory. Um, normally they, they kind of have, you know, almost 10 foot of trunk before you start to, to really see twigs. Um, so typically it's, it's not readily browsed by deer, uh, but they will really focus on kind of that, that new growth that's starting to come up. Up next is the black walnut. Um, and I think most people are probably familiar with this species. Um, black walnuts are, are a very important tree um, commercially. Um, the wood is kind of deep brown and it's really easily workable. So it's kind of a favorite for a lot of carpentry, a lot of um, woodworking. Um, early settlers used it a lot for, um, for you know, fence posts and gun stocks and furniture, uh, but it also can be used as a dye or as an ink. Um, and so if you look at these, um, kind of the, the fruit of a black walnut, it's got this hull that surrounds it. And if you ever played on a farm that had black walnuts and you threw them at each other, um, we all know they kind of stained your hands for <laughs> a couple days. 
Um, and so early Native Americans realized this and they, they started to use it as kind of dye and ink. Um, so that's just kind of a, a quick factoid. Um, currently, their um, fruit walnuts are cultivated for their taste. Um, and the, a really interesting kind of factoid about black walnuts, and kind of, it's kind of a reason why you don't typically see them um, more in kind of an urban setting, is that they have this, it's called allelopathy, um, I believe is the correct term. And it essentially means that the tree releases chemicals um, from its root system which essentially harms any other flora that is trying to grow in that specific area. And so it has the ability to, to outcompete many other species. And so that's typically why you don't really find it in yards uh, because it will kind of kill a lot of the other vegetation that's around um, that tree. But the black walnut um, is pretty easily identifiable just by that unique fruit. Um, there's not really another fruit um, in Illinois that looks like it. Um, if you do look at the leaves, Again, you can see that it is a pinnately compound leaf. Um, so if you look at that bottom picture, that is an entire leaf. Um, that's not you know, a twig with several leaves. That is one leaf with many leaflets. Um, so that's kind of a, a really unique characteristic of the, the black walnut. And like Harvey said, um, yeah, lot, lots and lots of people use them um, to um, dye traps. Um, so it's a very common species um, that, that trappers utilize to kind of get that ink and kind of dye their traps. In terms of kind of wildlife food value, um, it, it's readily consumed by woodpeckers, foxes, squirrels. Um, deer typically don't really spend too much time with it. Um, they will, again, focus on kind of browsing um, some of these twigs and some of the new growth that comes up. Now we're going to transition to the maples. Um, so pretty much the majority of the species we've covered thus far have been alternately arranged. Um, so those leaves are alternate on the, the tree. Um, maples, it's very indicative of kind of the, the maple family that they are opposite. Um, so if you look at a leaf, you're going to see two leaves coming off at the same node. And so you're going to have kind of two leaves going opposite directions, making it opposite. Um, and a lot of people might think that that's kind of not necessarily a good identifying characteristic, but there are not many um, opposite species um, of trees. The majority of them are going to be alternate. And the really cool thing about maples is they, they display kind of opposite arrangement to an, to an extent that you can actually see it in the leaves or in the, not the leaves, in the twigs as well. So if you kind of just look at the overall structure of a maple tree, you'll actually see that the branches are also arranged oppositely. Um, and that's a really good indicator that you're looking at a maple. Um, but the red maples, um, it's by far one of the most common and widespread deciduous trees of, of kind of Eastern North America, as well as Central North America. Um, the US Forest Service actually recognizes it as the most abundant native tree um, that we have in North America. Um, it's often viewed as a pest by many um, wildlife professionals as well as land managers. And I think it kind of gives a, a bad rap. A lot of people think that the red maple is just overtaking forests and displacing all these other trees and doesn't really provide a lot of wildlife value. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, the red oak is typically found more in young forest where human disturbance is common. Um, so this is a tree that is fairly shade intolerant. And if you think back to those terms, that means it, it doesn't really like to be in areas where it's overcompeted, where there's a closed canopy above it. Um, you're typically going to find it in more open areas. Um, and what most wildlife managers, I think th this is the case, when they're thinking about, you know, maples overtaking a forest, I think they're actually referring to a species that we're going to discuss next, which is the sugar and black maple. Um, as well as the silver maple. And those are because those are more shade tolerant. So they have that ability to continue to grow inside the forest, even with a very dense canopy. So again, red maples are opposite. Um, they are simple leaves and they have kind of these, it's a very unique serration. Um, it's kind of classified as being doubly toothed or doubly serrated. Uh, but I like to think of the, the red maple, it almost looks like a, a dinosaur footprint. Um, it's got kind of the, the roundness behind it, and it's got that really prominent middle lobe um, that will be longer 
than all the other lobes on that tree or on that leaf. Um, typically, they're going to be three lobed. Occasionally, um, specifically the, the sun leaves, you might find being five lobed. Um, and now the, the fruit is what most people call a Samara. Um, it is a, it's basically a one seeded fruit um, that has wings. And so if you look at kind of the, the shape of it, we all know we've all kind of thrown them in the air and they do that kind of helicopter thing on the way ground, on the way to the ground. And that just kind of aids in seed dispersal. So it allows those seeds, instead of just falling directly underneath the tree, it allows them to get some space and kind of re regenerate um, that growth. And that's really important because deer will readily, readily, readily consume um, any new growth from these trees. And if you're ever walking through the woods, um, focus on the ground um, just for a few minutes and you're gonna see tons and tons of, it, it, typically it's just gonna be a single maple leaf um, that's kind of coming off, you know, maybe a five or six inch little stalk sticking out of the ground. Um, and that's kind of a lot of times the biggest it's gonna get in the interior of the forest. Um, it's gonna be consumed by deer. And again, it is a fairly shade intolerant species, so it really doesn't like those closed canopies. Up next is the silver maple. Um, you can see it's gonna have that, that same fruiting structure of a double Samara. Um, and if you think back to um, the last species, you can see on the silver maple, these, le these lobes are a lot deeper. And so they have really deep sinuses that almost go entirely to the midrib of that, that leaf. Um, now the silver maple obviously gets its name from the underside of that leaf. And so you can see that again, it's almost silvery white. And if you think back a little bit to kind of what, what causes a leaf to be silver, kind of that, that white cover, it's that pubescence. It's gonna have a very thick um, hairiness on the bottom side of that leaf. Um, and that kind of gives it away that, that it is in fact a silver maple. Now I want you to focus specifically on this species and look at the, um, the leaf margin. Um, so I'm not gonna give any clues, but the next species that we're gonna look at can be somewhat confusing and somewhat, uh, it looks similar to this. Um, so I'll have Jason kind of flip over to the next one really quick and we'll kind of flip back and forth just for a second. And so you can see the, the black and sugar maple, the leaves are almost the same shape but their leaves are entire. So it doesn't have those kind of doubly serrations that, that the silver maple does. Now the black and sugar maple, this is technically two different species. So you have a black maple and a sugar maple. Um, I find it a little, a little ridiculous um, that, that a lot of people split these into two different species. Um, they hybridize a lot and the really only way that you're going to be able to identify between a black and a sugar is looking at the shape of the hairs on the underside of the leaf. Um, so for most people, if you just call it a black or sugar maple, um, that, that's going to be um, plenty enough. So the, again, it's a maple, so the leaves are going to be opposite. Um, they're simple. Um, the leaves are about, you know, three to six inches long with three to five leaves, uh, three to five lobes, just like the, the red maple. But you can see that the sides of the lobes often have kind of secondary lobes, um, just like the silver maple that did. So you almost have lobes inside of lobes. Um, deer will feed on young twigs, um, the buds, and the leaves. And I think we had somebody draw on the screen, so if we could get whoever did that, if you could just clear that off, that'd be great. Um, up next, we're going to discuss the green ash. Um, so the green ash is, again, it's another opposite tree, an opposite arranged tree, and it's a pinnately compound leaf. Now these, um, if you've ever heard of the emerald ash borer, um, over recent years, we've had lots and lots of, of emerald ash borer cases in the state. And it's essentially a bug that embeds itself into the green ash and essentially causes them to start to die off. Um, so green ashes are becoming a little less prominent on the landscape, um, but they are still there and they do have a lot of wildlife value that a lot of people don't realize. Um, so the seeds, if you look at them, um, you might not even think that that be eaten by many different species, but it's eaten by quail, by pheasants, by turkey, wood ducks, um, many small mammals. Um, as well as, again, deer are going to eat the young twigs and buds. And particularly, ash trees are very shade tolerant. So you're going to find a lot of young growth 
um, kind of in the right in the heart of the forest. And that's a, a really interesting thing because that means there's going to be lots of kind of shrubby sized green ash in the forest. And so that's going to provide a really good food source for, for deer as they kind of browse on the twigs, um, the buds, as well as the leaves. Up next is bush honeysuckle. So now we're going to transition uh, kind of to shrubs and some of these uh, more common vines. Um, I think just about everybody is probably familiar with the bush honeysuckle. Um, unfortunately, it has kind of taken over uh, much of the Midwest um, and it's pretty much prominent in just about every, every forest that you're going to find in the Midwest. Um, if you look at the, the bottom right picture, that is a very common scene um, in Illinois because these tree, these plants just are very tough. Um, they experience, they also uh, use that, that term I referred to a little bit earlier with the black walnut, the allelopathy, um, where they essentially secrete toxins from their root system. And that allows them to basically outcompete any other vegetation that's in the area. And unfortunately, the berries do not provide much wildlife food for any different species. Um, I remember a study a few years ago actually looked at um, essentially the caloric content of, of these berries, and it actually costs significantly more energy for the animal to digest it um, than it does provide. Um, so it's one of those that's not a very good wildlife species. Um, it is exotic and is introduced. It was introduced almost 100 years ago at this point um, from Asia. And the really interesting thing is it, it's so easy to identify, particularly if it's the right time of year, um, it's going to be one of the very first plants that begin to, to fruit in the spring and begin to emerge out of dormancy. Um, so if you're walking around in March or April and you just see a little bit of green, chances are that's going to be bush honeysuckle. It's also one of the last plants to enter dormancy, so it's going to stay green a lot longer than other species. And that gives land managers kind of a unique advantage in that you're, you have the ability to treat this specific plant while other plants are still in that dormancy period. Um, and most plants, when they're in their dormancy period, um, will not absorb um, much of the chemicals, so you can treat this um, during that time. I saw we did have a quick question from Tracy. Um, to kill it, would you cut it off and put some Roundup on it? Um, yes, that is about the best way to control it. Um, unfortunately, bush honeysuckle, even if you go in and cut everything down, um, it's very notorious for re-sprouting. Um, from any trunk that you left standing. And so most wildlife managers will go in, cut the entire plant out, and then they'll come over and basically rub herbicide on that, that top um, of the stump. And then it'll hopefully absorb that into the root system and basically kill the plant. And now everybody's favorite, poison ivy. Um, so poison ivy, um, again, leaves of three, let it be. Um, it's, it's a plant that can ruin, ruin your week. <laughs> um, so the chemical that's, that's found in poison ivy, um, uretiol, actually causes a severe itchy rash that can spread across your body. Um, it's particularly dangerous if it's burned uh, because that uretiol can become um, basically airborne. Um, and can get into your lungs and get into your sinuses and your eyes and can become a, a real life-threatening situation. So if there's one plant that you want to try to identify, um, this would be one. Um, it is a vining plant, and if you do happen to see vines on a tree, there's a few different things that you can look at to tell if it's poison ivy. So if you look at this top picture, you can see it has these aerial roots that basically glue that thing to the tree. Um, all of that does contain this uretiol and can also cause that same reaction that leaves can. Um, many people don't realize that. And many people, as they're climbing up a tree, uh, maybe to hang a deer stand, um, they'll kind of see this vine and they'll oh, just kind of rip it and get it out of the way. Um, not the best idea because, again, it can provide that, that same um, uretiol. Now, it is a popular food source among many different wildlife species. Um, it is a fruiting um, vine, so it does produce little white and blue berries. Um, and those are readily eaten by many songbirds, um, as well as pheasants and quail. Um, and of course, small mammals and deer are going to browse on, on the leaves, on the twigs, as well as on those, those berries. 
Um, but the big thing to remember about poison ivy is leaves of three, let it be. And so this is another one that, that many people get confused with poison ivy. Um, so it's kind of a lookalike. This is Virginia creeper. Um, it grows in the same habitats, but remember it doesn't have three leaves. Um, poison ivy has this tendency to become very red in the fall. Um, and Virginia creeper follows that exact same trend. So a lot of people get these confused. Um, but one thing I really want to point out between the two, even though you know leaves of three let it be, some of the Virginia creeper might only have three leaves occasionally. But if you look how that how that leaf is attached, um, that's kind of the dead giveaway. Um, so Jason, if you can go back to poison ivy just for a sec. And you can see that the leaf, especially that, that kind of terminal leaf, so that leaf that's in the middle, you can see it has that long petiole before the leaf starts where it's attached. Um, and if we go back to Virginia creeper, all those leaves, they basically don't have a petiole, so they're all connected at the base of each other. And so that's a really good indication. Virginia creeper, um, it is a very common um, food source for many different species, particularly deer. Um, they're gonna browse on the leaves as well as the twigs. Um, but we mainly put this here just to kind of point out the, the look-alikeness of, of, of it to uh, poison ivy. So poison sumac. Um, so this is another tree that that causes you know that same kind of allergic reaction in a lot of people. Um, it contains the exact same chemical, ureshiol, that poison ivy does. Um, now this is one that, that's fairly difficult to identify for, for many people. Uh, but what I, what I wanna point out before we get too much further is this is not very common in Illinois. Um, I have never seen one um, in Illinois. I've seen them in other states, uh, but it is not very common out here. So it's not something you have to think about too much. Um, but if you look at the fruiting structure on this specific species, I want you to kind of keep that in mind um, as we move to a few other species of sumac, um, because it essentially looks like a sumac tree with just different fruiting structures. Another very common um, woody vine that you're gonna find in Illinois woodlands is grapevine. Um, there's many different species of grapevine, but we're just gonna kind of focus on, on what many people call um, summer grape. Um, the leaves are alternately arranged on the stem and they're about six inches long. And grape vines have kind of this unique, they're what, what many people call polymorphic, which means they can have multiple different shaped leaves on the same plant. Um, so the, the leaves are going to be very variable, um, but the dead giveaway for grapevine is the actual vine. Um, so if you look at this bottom right picture, we've all seen these kind of draping from big trees. Um, but the dead giveaway that it's not poison ivy is focus on kind of the edge of it. It doesn't have those aerial roots um, that we saw prominent in poison ivy. Um, it, it doesn't really attach itself to the, the trunk of the tree. It'll attach itself to kind of the top of the tree. And as that tree continues to grow up, it's just going to continue to grow with it and make sure it's kind of hung on to a specific spot it's not gonna necessarily cling to the side of that trunk um, like poison ivy does. Um, and you're gonna find this all over just about any habitat, um, any part of the state that's gonna be common. It is very common in very disturbed sites. So along the edges of, of woodlands um, and power line cuts on fence rows. So in areas that are frequently disturbed, um, whether it's by mowing or, or different things like that, but it, it really likes that, that disturbance. Greenbrier, so this is one that most people are probably familiar with just because of what it does to your legs after you walk through it. Um, again, there are many different briar species um, in Illinois, but we're really just gonna kind of focus on kind of the group as a whole. So greenbrier are very, very important for many different wildlife species, not just in terms of food, but also in terms of cover. Um, so greenbrier is one of these things that, that can just kind of become very common in the, the, the floor of either a forest or even sometimes prairies. And it just provides a little bit of different cover um, for many species, particularly for rabbits, um, for quail, and as well as for pheasants occasionally. 
uh, but pheasants typically are, are more found in big grasslands. Uh, but quail really need a, a significant portion of, of woody vegetation, um, particularly in the winter and fall. They kind of use that as cover to escape the snow. And this is one of those plants that acts as really good cover um, for northern bobwhite quail is they can get in under it, get out of the snow, and kind of use that, that body heat um, to kind of keep themselves warm. Now green briars, um, obviously they have thorns, uh, but the big distinction between some of the other thorn vines that we're going to discuss in a minute is the, the color of the leaf. And you can see it's got this very shiny, glossy top to it, but it's also a very thick leaf. If you were to pick it up in your hand, it feels like a very robust leaf. It doesn't feel you know, like it's a, a paper thin leaf. It's got some thickness to it. Um, so it does make a, a decent food source for deer as they browse on it. Uh, but it's what I really want to highlight is its importance for um, northern bobwhite quail. Another big one that is um, becoming more and more common in the state, unfortunately, is multiflora rose. Um, this is another exotic and invasive species. Um, it's native to Asia and was brought over almost 100 years ago at this point. Um, was it the best decision to bring it over? Uh, but somebody made that decision and they did. Um, and it's becoming more and more common on the landscape. And unfortunately, it it seems to outcompete a lot of our native roses. And so we're losing a lot of our native roses just because the multiflora rose is filling that, that same kind of niche, but has a, a better, it almost does better, but it provides less um, wildlife value. Um, now the big distinction between the multiflora rose and our native roses, if you look at um, where the, the flower basically attaches to the stem, um, so if you look at this bottom picture, you can kind of see that big stem going up diagonally through the picture. And if you look at where those are attached to it, you'll see these kind of fringe-like um, hairs at the base of the, they call it a stipule. And if those are fringed like they are in this specific image, that gives you a good indication that it's multiflora rows. And if they were basically an entire structure and not kind of fringed or hair-like, um, that would be a native rose. Um, multiflora rose, again, it really likes disturbed sites. Um, it's one of those that you'll find in open prairies. Um, so if you're ever walking through a pheasant site and, and you get something caught on your leg, chances are it's multiflora rose um, or greenbrier. Um, those are kind of the, the big two. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam for a few minutes and he's going to discuss um, the next species that we're going to cover. So take it away, Adam. Thanks, Dan. So the next tree we're gonna talk about is the hackberry. Um, you can find these in bottomland woodlands statewide. Uh, the bark is pretty gray and warty, uh, becomes scaly and rough as it gets older. Uh, the leaves on this tree are alternate um, on the stem and the leaves are uneven at the bases. So if you look at this uh, leaf picture right here in the middle of the screen, you can tell um, that it's uneven where it connects to the stem. Uh, leaves are coarse toothed on the edges uh, and the fruits ripen in September and October. Um, deer do browse on these uh, if they don't have other preferred food in the area. Uh, so they do eat them once in a while. Uh, again, this, this tree, if you goes to the next slide, I believe there's a picture of it. That is the bark of the tree. Um, so again, this tree is not good for stands, especially climber stands. Uh, it's very loud and the bark is actually really tough. Uh, it's hard for a uh, stand to grip into. Um, so just watch out and beware for that one. But this bark is pretty much a dead giveaway for hackberries. It's really warty and gray and uh, you can't miss it. The next one is flowering dogwood. Uh, very round crown on the tree, um, very symmetrical usually. Uh, leaves are arranged opposite. Um, they're up to six inches long and about three inches wide, oval shaped. Uh, the fruit on this tree is a red berry about a half inch long. And it's found on rocky and wooded slopes and in bottomlands. Uh, it's also used as an ornamental tree. A lot of people plant them in their yards. Here on the campus at uh, the U of I, there's a lot of those planted all around as well, just because as you can see, they 
uh, look pretty um, nice in the springtime when they're blooming and yeah, pretty neat tree. Uh, the fruits are eaten by wildlife and usually these trees are good for nesting songbirds as well. So the next tree that uh, we do have a question. Um, Dan, if you can answer that one, please. I don't know the answer to that exactly. Um, next tree is Osage Orange. You guys will see a lot of this out in the woods, especially if you're um, hunting near farm country. Um, other name for it is called hedge apple. Uh, the leaves on this tree are alternate simple. Uh, there, there's no teeth, about three to five inches long, thick, firm, and dark green. Uh, there are thorns on the twigs, and the bark is usually orange-brown with deep furrows, so like big uh, kind of ridges in the bark, and the inner bark is bright orange, so it's really distinct. You can really tell um, and distinguish which tree it is. It is a non-native. Um, there is minimal wildlife benefit. I have seen deer eating these things, but you don't see it very often. They're kind of a little too big for deer to eat. Uh, but it is good cover. They're usually, they grow pretty thick. Uh, good trees to use if you're wanting to hunt on the ground um, and use them as cover as well. So keep that in mind. Next tree is the persimmon. Uh, the leaves on this tree are alternate, simple, and usually two to six inches long, three, one to three inches wide. Um, they're the broadest in the middle, as you can see in the bottom picture here. Uh, they produce an orange uh, slash purple fruit. Um, it is sweet and it is edible when it is ripe. Um, the fruit, buds, leaves are eaten by deer, possum, squirrel, northern bobwhite, and wild turkey. Uh, many songbirds do eat the fruit as well. Um, lots of wildlife really like the fruit, uh, especially when it's ripe. Uh, a good indication, uh, kind of, I know Dan has done this and myself when I was taking dendrology, our professors made us try um, to eat the fruit before it was ripe and it instantly uh, sucks all the moisture out of your mouth. So it's kind of crazy. Uh, but when it is ripe, it's very good. You can use them for uh, jams, pies, and all sorts of good stuff. Um, and the bark on this tree is super blocky, and it's almost like solid black in color. Um, and and it's, it literally looks like little squares stacked on, on top of each other. So it's, it's pretty easy to identify. Um, and it is a good, stand, or a good tree for tree stands as well. Next up is the white mulberry. Uh, these leaves are alternate and about two to six inches long and are polymorphic, which means um, they're all usually different shapes. If you look at the top picture, this is all a stem from um, a white mulberry. And as you can see, the leaves are all different. That's kind of crazy how that happens, but that's a super uh, easy indication of white mulberry. It's found in open lands, savannas, and thickets. Produces berries that are eaten readily by birds, squirrels, and many mammals. And when you break open the leaf, uh, there's this white sap that leaks out. So that's another super uh, easy indication. Um, I don't believe there's any other tree in Illinois that does that. So if you break open the leaf, again, you're going to have uh, a, light, a white sap leak out of it. So that's a good, good indication of that. Next one is common blackberry. Uh, the leaves on this are alternate compound with three to five leaflets. Uh, leaflets are two and a half to four inches long and egg shaped. Uh, the fruits come up in about June, August, so right about now, um, and are abundant deep violet black um, blackberries. And they're really good. Uh, if you guys have never tried wild blackberries, um, I do recommend next time you guys see them in the woods. Again, super good for jams and jellies and uh, pies and whatnot. Um, 
or just a, a quick snack when you're in the woods. Very tasty. Um, and deer, of course, eat all this and a uh, bunch of other animals in the woods. Very popular with wildlife. And you can usually find them on like the edge of tree lines, um, edges of fields, and, and thicker briar patch areas. Um, they are fairly common. Next up is smooth sumac. Uh, so the leaves on this one are alternate pinnately compound, about 12 to 16 inches long, uh, with about 15 to 23 leaflets. Um, broken stems also do uh, exude a white sticky sap. So uh, I stand corrected with the, the previous one, white mulberry. Um, dozens of birds eat the fruit. Deer and rabbits will eat the leaves and twigs, and Native Americans used to use this to make a lemonade-like drink. Um, they are, the stems on this, or the leaves on this look really long. They look like uh, kind of branches, but they are leave, uh, full leaves. The leaflets are the smaller green leaves coming off of it. Um, and then the unmistakable big kind of red cone fruit that sits on top. So those are pretty hard to miss as well. Next up is wild black cherry. Uh, you can find these along wood edges, fence rows, and, and thickets as well. Uh, the bark is thin and smooth and red brown if it's a younger tree. Um, the leaves are arranged alternately and can be six inches long. They're smooth and shiny with fine teeth along the edge. And the fruit is a droop, um, it looks like a cherry. Um, and again, the bark has corky horizontal lenticels. So kind of, uh, if you guys look at that bottom left picture, uh, it has those horizontal stripes going on. Um, kind of reminds me of hackberry and kind of look like that kind of warty. Um, so just remember that, uh, gives it away. Eastern redbud. The leaves on this tree are alternate and about two and a half to five inches long. Found common in central and southern Illinois. Uh, they're in usually in deciduous woodlands, rocky woodlands, and river valleys. In the springtime, uh, they have super bright pink flowers. Um, in the summertime, the flowers become flattened brown seed pods. Uh, wildlife do like to eat those seed pods. Um, and a if you look in the bottom picture here, you can tell how the twig is zigzagged. So it kind of goes left, right, left, right. Uh, that's a super easy indication that is Eastern red bud. Um, and if you look at the bark, uh, you can't really tell in the top picture, but if you guys would see these, um, the bark is just grayish brown and where the bark kind of cracks open the ridges in between, uh, it's almost like a salmon pink color. So it's super, um, easy to identify that way as well. And the leaves are heart shaped. So that's another good indication. And again, these can be used as ornamental trees as well. Uh, a lot of them on campus here too, because um, they look nice in the springtime, but they look even nicer in the woods when they're bright pink like that. Next up is bald cypress. Uh, so the leaves on this one are about quarter inch to three quarters inch long. Um, if you guys can see each little pine needle is actually a leaf. Um, and they're found in the southernmost tip of Illinois, uh, usually in bottomlands, soggy wooded areas and swamps. And the bottom of the tree trunks look like legs supporting the tree. If you can see that top picture, um, that they just build up a big root system so they don't get washed away. So they're super thick at the bottom there. Very cool looking tree. Um, and yeah, pretty easy to identify with that. Next up is the Eastern Red Cedar. This you guys, this tree you guys will see a lot um, hunting in Illinois. Uh, they have awe-shaped and scale-shaped leaves. Um, awe-shaped leaves make a one, two, three-year-old tree. Scale-shaped leaves make it a three-plus-year-old tree. 
uh, again, found all over the state in upland woods, rocky bluffs, and tree edges, grown up fields. These trees basically grow anywhere, um, make great deer bedding cover. Uh, so if you guys find a cedar thicket on the, um, at the places you guys are hunting, it's a good indication that there might be some deer bedding there or wildlife activity in general. Um, yeah, definitely a, a place worth checking out if you guys can find one of those. Next up is river birch. Um, again, this tree is found in most of the state, found in flood, flood plains next to rivers and streams. Uh, shaggy papery bark that looks like it's peeling. That's pretty unmistakable if you guys see that. I'm sure everyone's seen that in, in parks and whatnot. Um, the leaves are alternate and simple, and they are tooth edge and about three inches long. The fruit is a small nut with hairs around it about one and a half inches long. Again, found in very moist areas. And usually, kind of like in this bottom picture, you find them in clumps. Uh, it, it's not usually just one birch growing. It's a bunch of birches growing uh, in a specific area. Um, and yeah, that's another one that's pretty easy to identify. Next up is black willow. The leaves are alternate and about three to five inches long. These are found in wet soil areas. Uh, found again all over the state and um, found in bottomland swamps and riverbanks. Um, these can provide super thick cover, especially when they're young and um, not that tall yet. And a lot of times they'll be lining the whole riverbank, especially when they're young and they're super thick and do provide good bedding as well for um, deer and other wildlife. Next one is the American sycamore. Uh, the leaves are alternate simple, usually four to eight inches long. Um, two, and they usually have two to five shallow lobes with coarse teeth on the leaf. Uh, the under face of the leaf is whitish and hairy. Uh, the trunk cavities of sycamores provide shelter for animals um, and all kinds of nesting birds. Uh, the bark is usually really smooth, especially um, where it's they're pretty unmistakable because you have the white and the, the gray bark uh, and it's super smooth. And again, I would not recommend climbing these trees, especially after it rains. Um, they can be pretty slick and uh, kind of scary to do so. So, And those are usually found in uh, bottom lands or, or low forest areas. And now I believe we're gonna turn it back to Dan. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, next we're going to discuss the American elm. <clears throat> so the kind of elm trees in general, um, they have very unique bark that, that kind of really gives, gives away that it's a member of the elm family. Um, if you kind of pay attention to this bark, it's a very dark gray brown um, with these very deep um, kind of what, what people call crossing ridges. Um, I almost like to think that it kind of looks like almost alligator type scales that, that kind of run down that, that, that tree. It's got these very pronounced ridges and these very deep fissures. Um, and that, that's very prominent on, on most elm species. Um, the American elm is an alternate um, leaved tree. It does have simple leaves and the, the leaves um, are doubly serrated. So that means they have one serration, but inside of that serration they have another. So it's kind of that double um, serration. The leaf base is asymmetrical which most leaves, when you look at them, they're kind of a lot of times fairly symmetrical across the entire leaf. Uh, but if you look really closely at, at kind of the leaf base, so where that particular leaf attaches to the stem, um, you can see that it's um, very asymmetrical. So one side of that is going to be broader or the other side is gonna be a little bit narrower. Um, a really cool feature of, of the elms, um, and this is true for almost all alternate species, but it's very pronounced. Um, on the elms, kind of like it is on the red bud, that that alternate tree almost forms kind of a zigzag twig. And it's very pronounced on, on elm species. So if you kind of see that, it, it again, um, kind of helps. And if you look at the leaf um, venation, um, it's very similar to a couple other species that we talked about where it has that, those very parallel um, leaf veins that come right off um, the midrib. 
the fruit is a Samara. Um, they're kind of small and flat. They're very nondescript and you're not gonna, gonna see much of them. Um, but they do provide a lot of wildlife value, um, particularly because the, the, unique, the unique form of the tree. Um, so if you look at some of these pictures in the top left, you can see that it's got a lot of bigger size kind of branches that almost come all the way down the trunk. And that provides a lot of unique um, capabilities for squirrels to build nests as well as other uh, land mammals. So raccoons and things um, use elm trees a lot. Um, and yeah, they're, they're fairly common in Illinois. You can pretty much find them in a wide variety of habitats. Um, they're also a very common ornamental species. So you'll see them very frequently in parks as well as college campuses and, and things like that. Up next, we have the sassafras. I think this is one of the cooler tree species in Illinois. Um, if you've never come across a sassafras, sassafras tree, um, again, the leaves are polymorphic, meaning that they can look very different. So you, if you look at these, this bottom picture, um, you can see you, you have kind of a, a, a three-lobed leaf. You have almost one that has one small lobe and a big lobe that almost looks like a catcher's mitt. And then you kind of have just your normal circle or oval-shaped leaf. Um, now, if you've never come across one of these, I urge you to just pick a leaf off of the tree um, and grind it between your, your two hands and give it a, a quick smell. Um, you'll instantly kind of be inundated by the, this Fruit Loop smell. It's, it's the strangest thing in the world, but it has this really fruity smell. Um, and if you've ever heard of uh, sarsaparilla, which is a, a beverage similar to kind of root beer, um, it's actually made from the roots of the sassafras tree. Um, there has been lots of documentation and research over the past few decades that show that that is that sars sarsaparilla is actually a carcinogen. Um, so it's not something you see too commonly now. Uh, but back in kind of the 60s and 70s, this tree was used a lot um, to make that that uh, sarsaparilla. Um, so the leaves again are polymorphic; they're going to be alternate. Um, and again, the the big giveaway with the sassafras is just the shape of the leaf. And if you have any question whether it is a sassafras. Um, just grind up that leaf and, and give it a, a, a quick smell and you'll be inundated by that, that Fruit Loop smell. Um, it's fairly common in central and southern Illinois. Um, it is a fairly shade intolerant species, so typically you're, you're going to find it in highly disturbed areas. Um, once the canopy starts closing, it's not going to be as, as robust. Um, and the majority of the sassafras that I come across in um, central Illinois, they're, they're all fairly small. Um, in Kentucky, um, where I used to live for a few years, we get some some really nice sized sassafras trees. Uh, but it, the, the trees that I, I mostly come across in Illinois are about you know six to ten inches diameter, and that kind of seems to be where they camp out. Uh, but you'll find a lot, a lot, a lot of young growth of sassafras in some of these more disturbed areas or along the edges of woodlands. The black locust. Um, this is one that a lot of people are probably familiar with just because of the uniqueness of, of that leaf. Um, so remember, this is a pinnately compound leaf. Um, so what you're seeing in, in some of these pictures is an entire leaf with many leaflets attached. Um, the really kind of dead giveaway for the black locust is that it's going to have stipular spines, um, which are basically thorns, um, and they're going to be very long, but not near as long as the next tree that we're going to cover after this. Um, but the, the, leaf sh the leaflets shaped are also very oval. Um, there's not another species that I'm aware of in Illinois that has kind of these pinnately compound leaves with these very oval and rounded um, leaflets. Um, most species that are pinnately compound or bipinnately compound, their leaflets typically um, kind of come to a point where on the black locust, they're gonna be completely rounded and oval shaped. And similar to the, the, the black locust, um, the honey locust does provide a lot of wildlife food value. Uh, but one of the, the worst parts about the honey locust, which again is a non-native species, um, it was brought in. And look at those thorns on this thing. I'm sure you guys have probably come across, excuse me, occasionally. Um, they're these really gnarly looking trees with these huge, huge, huge spines. Um, and it's one of those trees that a lot of people really like to put in parks. And I'm not really sure why, uh, because they're notorious for popping tires, whether it's vehicle tires, bike tires, um, so much so that it led a lot of cultivars to essentially develop a um, thornless honey locust. Um, so there is a variety 
of, of honey locust that is um, essentially thornless. And that's what they're starting to use more ornamentally, uh, but you can still find a lot of these even thorned varieties fairly common um, on, on kind of, you know, parks and different things like that. Um, it's a very, very, very um, shade intolerant species. So it's, it loves disturbance. Um, it's one of the first trees that'll kind of pop up in a new area. Um, if you go in and clear cut an area, um, honey locusts will start to grow rather quickly. So you're typically going to find it kind, kind of alongside of edges and roads and anywhere there's been some kind of disturbance in kind of the tree canopy. Once sunlight hits the ground, these things just for some reason really thrive. And as uh, Tracy mentioned, um, deer love these pods. Um, and the pods, if you've never seen them, they're extremely long. They're almost a foot long, as you can see in this picture. Um, they kind of spiral and have this unique shape, uh, but deer will sit there and just munch and munch these things down. Um, again, they are a pinnately compound leaf, um, so they're gonna look similar to a black locust, but the dead giveaway is gonna be the seed pod, as well as these just nasty thorns that are all over um, the trunk. So again, the fruit is going to be a legume, um, which is those, those pods, and those seed pods are pretty much consumed by a lot of different species. Um, quail are another species that really like um, honey locust, particularly because, again, quail really need that woody vegetation to thrive in the winter. Um, there, there are species that they're ground nesting, so they're going to be on the ground during snow events, and so it's really important for them to be able to get out of an area and just kind of get, get away from the snow and really young honey locusts provide a, a very thick um, kind of canopy cover that allows them, them to, to do so. Um, and again, they're gonna be readily consumed by rabbits, um, by deer, squirrels, and quail. And it, if you do happen to find an area that, that has a pretty substantial population of honey locusts, um, it's a great place to set up, particularly as acorns start to get readily consumed. Um, you'll see honey locusts will kind of continue to be on the ground for quite a length of time, and that can provide a really good um, food source um, for, for trees. Uh, I see we have a, a question from um, Colleen Martin. Why does the honey locust have years of small amounts of beans um, to thousands of beans? Um, that's a great question. It kind of goes back to, to some of the other species I mentioned earlier that, that have this um, kind of unique ad adaptation where it's called masting. Um, so they're going to put a lot of their effort into producing lots of seeds um, every other, instead of producing a certain amount of seeds every single year, um, they really try to try to overwhelm um, those seed eaters in a specific year. Um, so some years you'll have kind of just a, a normal production, and then one year you'll have one that's just really ramped up, and that's advantageous to that specific species because it overwhelms the the seed predators and allows some of those seeds to to continue to be dispersed and to basically stimulate regeneration and, and new new trees um, growing. So that, that's why you're going to see that in, in honey locust. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. He's going to help us wrap this up. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, I just want to say thanks a lot to Dan and Adam for uh, dusting off their old dendrology textbooks there and providing us with all this great information tonight. Um, I think you guys made your professor proud, uh, for sure. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody else for coming out tonight and uh, watching this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we will be sending out, uh, again, a copy of the PowerPoint that we just went over and a, uh, the, the YouTube video of this video um, recording. Then uh, also there will be a survey with that. And this is actually the first time that we provided this webinar. So if you guys would take a few minutes to fill out those surveys and if you have any constructive criticism, uh, or some praise for these guys, please let us know. And uh, we'll take that into consideration as we form uh, some more plant identification uh, going into the future. I think we're gonna build on this and move into other different types of shrubs and things like that um, that will help hunters uh, in the field here. Um, so with that, if we have any questions, we can start answering those. Yeah, I saw a few questions come through. Um, David Pakala asked, do you have a chart showing what would be good for deer slash turkey woods? And that's actually a really good question. That's something I was working on um, last week was actually kind of putting together um, kind of a, a quick PDF document that, that really um, shows a few of these species. Because obviously, um, you know, with this particular webinar, there's a lot more species that we would love to cover. Um, kind of like Tom mentioned, uh, pawpaw, chestnut, bittersweet. Um, there's a host of, of plants that we didn't cover. And so we're gonna try to make this 
kind of a, a big document that's going to really have um, everything in it. And another really good question I saw was when is part two? Um, so part two is going to really focus on um, what what many people call graminoids. So it's going to be grasses, sedges, and rushes, which are basically grass-like plants, as well as some of the native wildflowers. So we're going to dive more into, um, you know, not necessarily the woody plants, but some of the more um, kind of herbaceous vegetation. And so that will probably be coming out early next month. Um, we're in the process of scheduling them right now. So if you're not on our monthly newsletter, um, I recommend joining it. And if you did register for this event, then you are automatically added to that newsletter and it'll be sent out first thing in July and we'll kind of have all of our dates um, set for, for that month. And so you'll be able to see when that, that um, second session comes in. And Harvey asked, why would a red oak not produce acorns? I have a large one in the backyard. And that, that's a really tough question, particularly if it's not um, in a woodland, because a lot of times it can be an issue with the, the soil quality, um, as well as runoff. There's a lot of different issues there. My biggest recommendation would probably be to just contact a Illinois DNR forester and discuss that with him, and he'll probably be able to give you a lot more guidance than, than I can. Um, Tom asks, could you recommend a book for more information? Um, yes, there's a lot of really good plant identification books. Um, where I would probably start off first is um, with Illinois DNR's website. I know it's not the, the most user-friendly website, but there's a lot of really good resources on there. And I can send out a few um, PDF documents and plant keys that, that'll help you get a, a pretty good understanding of what species you're gonna come across in Illinois. And so we will um, make sure to incorporate that into the email that we distribute out tomorrow. Another question from David, what would you look for in terms of trees for setting up a deer stand nearby? Um, that's a great question. Um, now, a quick follow-up question for you. Are you referring to a tree that you're going to hang your stand in or just trees um, that you're looking you know, to, to draw in deer? So are you looking for acorn? Um, if you could clarify that, then we can um, give a, a pretty good answer for that one. Draw in deer, perfect, yes. Um, so there's a lot of really good deer producing trees. Um, again, early in the season, I'm not focused very much on trees. Um, early in the season, I'm gonna be focused on a lot of the agriculture crops that may be adjacent to that property or might be near there uh, because you're, you're really not gonna start seeing acorns start to drop until kind of late October. And if they're standing <laughs> row crops anywhere near it, they are still going to be hitting that, those specific areas. So. Um, early in the season, I'm not going to focus too much on tree, you know, composition or, or things like that. But as you, as you move through October, I'm going to focus, kind of Halloween is when I'm really going to start focusing on white oak flats. So areas that have a high population of white oaks, because um, again, those are the preferred. And then um, you're going to really transition to um, kind of red oaks. So as that, that season continues to progress, um, that's when I'm going to make the, the switch to red oaks. Once I start seeing that a lot of the white oak acorns that are you know near me or on the ground have been consumed, um, that's going to that's a pretty good indication that deer are going to switch um, and, and kind of alter their patterns to to some of the red oaks that are going to still be prominent um, on the ground. Um, and yes, rut. I'm I'm a little bit different than a lot of other hunters um, when it comes to to hunting rut. A lot of people focus on trying to hunt bucks, but what I try to tell people is during rut. Bucks have one thing on their mind, right? And that's breeding as many does as possible. So even during the rut, I'm personally going to be hunting the does because wherever there's gonna be does, there's gonna be a buck nearby. Um, whether he's just kind of circling downwind of them to see if anything are, are in heat or if he's actively chasing them. Um, so typically I'm still focused on hunting food sources during the rut. I know that's kind of counterintuitive for what a lot of people um, think, uh, but I do recommend if you give that a try, I, I bet you'll have, have a little bit of success. And yeah, for those who are still here, um, that, that was actually a great question that, that leads right into our next webinar. Um, that is this upcoming Tuesday. Um, so I believe that's July 28th and it's gonna be um, basically deer stand placement strategy. So we're gonna be able to apply some of these different um, kind of plant identifying characteristics that you learned today and some of the different wildlife food value for those species and how to apply that to your hunt and how to use wind direction, how to use some of these different um, techn technological advancements like 
satellite imagery, topographic maps, some of these other things to, to really get you set up in a, in a place that you can um, hopefully have success. So if you are interested in that, um, go ahead to learn to hunt il.com and register for that. And that is July 28th at seven o'clock. Awesome. Um, we also, uh, coming out soon, uh, we did an interview with a uh, CO officer. So if you're interested, um, we had some pretty good questions and answers uh, come from that interview that will be coming out on our YouTube channel. And we'll be pasting that to Facebook as well. So you guys can look for that, some for other content that we're coming out with here besides webinars. Um, look, we had another question from Harvey Watts. Is it legal to move acorns or honey locust fruit for hunting purposes? Um, I do not believe it is. Um, that's something that I, I would probably contact a conservation officer to hear it directly from them. Uh, but the way the wildlife code is, is currently written, it describes baiting as basically anything that is not a standard agricultural practice. Um, so planting sunflowers, standard agricultural practice. Um, planting corn, leaving some corn standing, that's a standard agriculture practice. I do not think moving acorns or honey locusts would fall into that. Um, so I would skew on the cautious side and say it is probably, le it is probably illegal and not advisable, uh, but that's a question I would probably refer to a conservation officer and just kind of get, get, their, get their take on the situation. Okay, uh, with that, if there's any other questions, we can get going. Uh, you guys can all have a wonderful evening. And uh, squirrel season opens up next weekend, I think, so August 1st, so we can start getting back out in the woods here. Uh, looks like we have one more question from Caesar. I'll, I'll take really quick. Um, Caesar asked, I'm new and would like to know how, where to hunt and when. Um, and you're in the right spot. Um, so we host um, several different workshops. Um, you can see kind of on the slide currently, typically um, we host in-person workshops that are really dedicated to the, the hands-on activities because um, a lot of this information, you know, we can cover, but until you actually do it or see it in practice, it's kind of um, difficult and especially difficult to replicate. Um, so once, you know, the, the situation with coronavirus and, and with um, the current, you know, phase four stay-at-home orders and, and things like this, Hopefully we'll be able to get back to in-person classes before um, deer season starts. I can't promise that right now, uh, but next month we will be starting up our big webinar series again, where we'll have um, deer hunting 101 classes, um, as well as upland hunting 101, small game 101. And so those webinars are designed um, for individuals just like you, um, Cesar, which you know we cover the basics. We start with you know rules and regulations, we go through equipment, we go through some basic strategies and safety, and we try to try to break it down as much as possible. So that's what I would look look into. Um, we do have a small game hunting 101 class on, I believe it's July 30th. So that's next Thursday, a week from today. Um, and so that's a pretty good recommendation. I would recommend registering for that. And small game is a really good entry point for hunting. It's not gear intensive. Um, there's not a lot of regulations that you need to know and follow um, to make sure you're safe and, and legal out there. Um, so small game is kind of a great entry point, something I recommend. So if you are interested in pursuing hunting, um, sign up for that small game hunting 101 um, webinar and hopefully you learn something. And we also do try to host as many mentored hunts as we can, where we will kind of pair you with an individual, take you out on a mentored hunt and kind of get you, get you started. Um, but again, we're gonna just going to have to wait and, and see how things unfold um, with the coronavirus before we can really commit to any of those specific dates. But if you stay tuned to our social media channels, um, you will see those mentored hunting opportunities um, pop up when we announce them. Awesome. Um, if you guys have any other questions that pop in your head uh, in the meantime, feel free to email us or message us on Facebook and we will get back to you. Uh, so we are here as a resource for you all. So anything we can do to help you guys with hunting in Illinois uh, or elsewhere, we're here to help you out. So please reach out and uh, thank you all for attending tonight and look forward to talking to you all in the future. Uh, have a great evening.